Psalm 63. O God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. To see thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. So why do we come together today? Do we come together to see what everybody's wearing? No. Nah. Do we come together just to see some friends we ain't seen in a week? No. No. We gather together as a body of Christ, as a family, to commune with God, to spend time feasting at his table, to sit with one another and love on one another in the presence of Almighty God. That's right. Amen. And I don't know about you, but when I get in the presence of God, something just begins to stir in me. And I can't help but praise him and tell him how much I love him and lift my hands to him and just cry out, God, you are good. I give you glory and honor. And that's what he desires from his people today. So can I tell you, his presence is here. Because the Bible says where two or three are gathered in his name, he is in the midst. And I want you to know he's here for you today. If you have a need, if you have anything, if you feel far away from God, today is the day that you can run back to him because he is standing with open arms waiting on you. God loves you. He sent his son Jesus to die for you. He wants you to come run to him. So this morning as we sing, as we worship, feel free. Lift your hands. Wave them before the Lord. Say, God, you are good. You are good. Are you ready to worship him? Amen. Father God, we've come into your house today with praise on our lips. We worship you and adore you today, Father. Let your will be done in this service. We will give you all the glory. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.
God, you say in your word that we are to be holy because you are holy. But God, as flesh and blood, we have no way of doing that. And you knew. So you sent your son, Jesus. And his precious blood was poured out on this earth. And because of that blood, our sins can be washed away. Because of that blood, we now have the ability to stand before a holy God. Because of that blood, we are made holy in your sight, Lord. And today, God, we thank you. We thank you for that precious gift of us. God, I pray that you would help us to understand the depth of what you've done for us. So that we will live up to that, Lord. That we won't sit back and, and just take it for granted. But God, that we would live a holy life before you. That we, we would put into action those things that your Holy Spirit tries to lead us into and guide us to, Lord. Because God, when we do that, your favor is on us. When we walk in your will, your presence is so strong. We have access to your power and authority. Lord. Yes, Lord. God, we thank you for your presence in this place. Such a sweet, sweet presence. God, I pray for those that are here this morning. Feel cold and empty. Feel so far away from you sometimes. I pray that right now, Lord, that you would go to them. That you would wrap your arms around them. That you would hold them close. Let them feel your love today.
because we know that you have prepared a place for us. And if you went to prepare a place and you are coming again to receive us unto you, Lord. God, we look forward to that day. And we say, even so, come, Lord, quickly. Father, thank you again for your presence in this place. Pray that every word that comes out of my mouth today, everything that is done in this place will be for your glory, Lord. That your will will be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Love on somebody this morning. Shake your hand. Love them back. experience that in your life. Amen. Amen. Absolutely. Father God, we bring this offering to you this morning. We pray that you would bless it and use it for your kingdom, Lord. And God, for everyone that gives, for those that don't have to give, I pray, God, that you would bless them, that you would hold true to your promise. God, that you would give it back, pressed down, shaken together, running over.
last few weeks, we've been going through the book of Colossians. And I don't know, well, I was about to say, I don't know if it's been fun for you, but it's been fun for me. But it hasn't been fun for me, really. Parts of it's fun. Other parts are like, ooh, gets on my toes a little bit. Because for those of you who have been Christians for a while, um, and I'm speaking for myself, and I'm assuming maybe you are the same, when you've been a Christian for a while, sometimes it gets easy to just kind of slack off, just kind of roll with the flow, and uh, it's all good, we're okay, you know, things, are, things are cool. And we, we forget sometimes that God has a, a specific plan for how he wants us to live. And if we're not careful, we get influenced by the world and, and what their plan for how people should live is. And we tend to compromise, try to fit in so that we don't cause issues or offend anybody. We live in a world where everybody gets offended, right? Anymore, you, if, if, if I like steak and you like chicken, you get offended because I'm eating a cow. And it's, I mean, that's the kind of things that happen in this world. It's ridiculous stuff sometimes. But if you really want to offend somebody, talk about the scripture. Talk about what God says. Because not only will you offend the world, but you'll offend, offend the church down the street. Because they have their take on what the Bible says. And that church believes that. And this church believes this. And this one believes that. And we have gotten to the point where we have no longer been the body of Christ, but we're just a bunch of body parts laying around. And that is not God's plan. Is not his design. When you are just a bunch of body parts laying around, you are dead. You can't function. You can't do what God has called you, the body of Christ, to do. So number one, and I didn't even intend to say this, but number one, as the church, we must come together. And there's only one way to do it. Come back to what the Word of God says. Not man's interpretation of the Word, but what the actual Word of God says. Because the Bible is very explicit and specific. It has absolutes. The world will tell you that there is no absolute. It's everything is gray. Whatever you like is good. Whatever I like is good. And that's not the case when it comes to God. The Bible is very specific. So that is the part I've had fun with in Colossians. Because it's been very specific. I like practicality. I like to know, tell me what you want in detail, and I will give you exactly what you want in detail. It makes it easy. I don't have to figure anything out. And Colossians has been that for us. It's been very specific. But before I jump into, I'm going to hit a couple highlights from last week, but before I start there, I want to read the scripture that I read to you before I started last week. It comes from Proverbs chapter 3. My son, forget not my law. But let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. That's where we get off so many times. We say, well, I think it should be this way. Well, you know, this is what I think. What you think ain't going to cut it. It's about what God thinks. Well, I feel in my heart. The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things. You can't trust your heart. If somebody says just go with your heart, you better be careful. If I go with my heart, I'm going to be in a mess. God didn't say I come so that you can have a life full of mess. He said I come so that you can have life abundant. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. Not just the ways you're going about on Sunday morning, but the ones you go about Monday at work, the ones you go about Friday night, Saturday night. All thy ways you need to acknowledge him. Am I getting too hard, right? Come on, bro. Hey, you, 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 get, to, you get to amen at me, buddy. We're going to shout. <laughs> My brother knows how to have church up here. I like having him on the front row. <laughs> Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. My son, 
despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. in. God will chastise you. He will break you down to help get you back on the right path. Yes, he's a loving God. That's why he will beat your tail if you get out of line. There's too many people, oh, he's a loving God. He would never, he would never allow you to go through that. He would never allow you to say, let me tell you, because he loves you, he will allow you to go through tough times. Just like you love your children, but you spank their behind when they want to keep touching the stove. Like, no, no. And then that time you let them touch it so they learn, oh, dang, I don't like that no more. You're a loving parent. God is a loving parent. So he will be specific with you and say, this you can do, this you don't do. And that's what I love about the word of God. I don't have to argue with somebody whether or not it's right or wrong. The world will argue up one side and down the other. And it's easy to get drugged into those arguments if, you don't, if you're not careful, especially on social media. Very easy. But you're arguing with people who have been blinded. You can't make them understand, okay? You're wasting your breath. You live the life in front of them. You live the way you're supposed to. When God has, gives you an opportunity, when they come to you and ask, then you can share the truth. But if you're just trying to find somebody out there that says something you don't like and try to prove them wrong, Sorry, you're wasting your bread. It doesn't work that way. So, I may not even get through this if I keep getting off track. Goodness. So last week, Colossians 3, we did the first half of the, the chapter. And it starts out like this. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead and your life is hid in Christ and in God. It is easy to seek the things of this world. It is easy to seek joy in stuff and material possessions. It's easy to seek happiness and, and good times in all the things the world says are fun and enjoyable. The dirty jokes. The bars. The clubs. Oh yeah, I'm going there. That's what the world says you can find your joy and your happiness and your peace in. The fact is all that stuff leads to chaos. It leads to pain. It doesn't lead to happiness and joy and peace. The only place you're going to find that is when you seek those things which are above. When you seek the heart of God, what His will and His desire is, then you will know peace. Okay? So God says, seek the things that I want. Then He says, mortify we talk about what that word means. It means to make it like a corpse, dried up, mortify these things. Fornication, which is unlawful sex, sex before marriage, those things. Mortify, kill those things. Uncleanness, lewd actions, speech, or thought. Inordinate affection, uh, affection chasing things that, that make you feel good. Covetousness, being greedy, wanting what others have. The Bible says that the people who chase after those things are children of disobedience. They're obstinate children. They're stubborn. <coughs> Don't chase those things. He's very clear. Do not chase those things. They will not lead to peace and joy. He said also put off these things. Anger, wrath, <coughs> malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth, lying, being deceptive. Don't do those things. If you call yourself a Christian and any of this is part of your life, I challenged you last week to sit down and look through your life and say, do any of these things fit where I'm at now? Am I doing any of this? If you are, repent. God will forgive you. He will help you get back on track. That's right. But you can't be the child of God that he designed you to be and have a life full of this stuff. We are not perfect. We all make mistakes. There are times where I lose my cool. Okay? We all do. But then there comes a time where I'm like, God, forgive me. Because the Holy Spirit's like, son, you knew better. You need to get this right. And that's when I respond and say, God, I am sorry. Please forgive me. Give me back in your favor. I don't want to walk over here doing my own thing. 
I found in my own life that when I do that, I step on things and it hurts and it leaves scars and it's painful and I don't want that in my life. But when I walk according to God's will, even when I don't understand the why or where, that pain doesn't follow me. It doesn't leave me with scars. It doesn't hurt. So I lay aside all these things so that I can walk in his will and his favor. This week we're going to the next set of verses in chapter 3. And one thing I love about God is he doesn't say don't do this without saying here's what you can do. Don't empty yourself of these things without filling yourself up with these things. He's a good God. He's a God of balance. Okay? He's not taking something away without giving something back that's way better. All right? And before I go any further, let me say this. If you ask anybody, what is Christianity? What should a Christian look like? You may get, if you ask 20 people, you may get 25 answers. There's, nobody can give you the specific answer, but the Word of God can. Jesus can. Don't rely on what other people's interpretation of a Christian is. You know, we've been hearing a lot about abortion and all this in the news and these uh, states that are allowing abortion and all this kind of stuff. And, and you make a comment that, you know, this is murder. And you, well, some Christian you are, Christians are supposed to be full of love. People will twist and pull and they have their own mindset of what a Christian is. Let me tell you, standing against sin does not mean you don't have love. It means you love enough that you don't want to see people have to go through the pain, the scarring, the things that come from sin. We're living in a world, and I may be getting out of line here. And if I do, I apologize. But the fact is this. We're living in a world where you better take a side. I ain't talking about Republican or Democrat. I'm not talking about liberal or conservative. I'm talking about God or flesh. Amen. You better take a side. Amen. Amen. And that doesn't mean you get out there and you berate the other side. It means you love, you serve, you help the ones who are stuck in the mess to see that God is a loving God. Yes. That he does have absolutes. That he does say this is right and this is wrong. Abortion is wrong. It is murder. Amen. And I will stand on that. Amen. But if you are having had an abortion, or if you are thinking about having an abortion, let me tell you, I will be the first one to stand in line and say, let me help. Let me serve you. Can we offer child care? Can we, what can we do to show you that there is more to us than just you are wrong? God didn't come to condemn. Neither should we. If we're truly Christ-like, looking like Christ, which is what that means, then we must be like him. We can't just sit around and condemn and act like we're holier than everybody else. Oh, that's wrong and that's wrong. Oh, God forbid you live and do these things. No, you better love the way Jesus did. That's right. He told people the truth. But he followed it with love. In church, you need to love this world. They're not going to come to your condemnation. They're not going to come to your hate. They're going to come because of the love of Christ. And if you will love people, they will see something different. And they will be drawn to that. Because the only way somebody's going to come to Christ is because the Holy Spirit draws them. And if the Holy Spirit in you is the one that's working through you, it will draw them to Christ. But if your flesh is getting in the way, it's not going to draw them. It's going to push them away. And it is high time the church starts looking like Jesus. We've tried to fit in with the world so that we don't offend and try to draw them in. That don't work. We've tried to stand over here and say, we are so different because you are so sinful. That don't work either. You better stand in line with God and his will and speak the exact same things he speaks. And then you will see people come to Christ. Amen. Thank y'all. Thank you. Now live it. Don't sit here and amen me and don't live it out in this world. We've got to live it, every one of us. It is tough, I understand. When you feel like you're being attacked for believing right, you want to respond in, in, in light, but you can't. You have to respond in love. If we don't love, we are useless. 
God called us to love this world, to give them the gospel, the good news. You don't get it by throwing it at them. You give it by serving it to them. Colossians 3.10 You have begun to live the new life in which you are being made new and are becoming like the one who made you. This new life brings you the true knowledge of God. Uh, what I did is I took each verse and I'm reading it from two different uh, interpretations here because I want you to, to grasp what's really being said. And the KJV says, And have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. You want to know what God knows? You want to think like he thinks? Then put him on. Remember earlier, a few weeks ago, we talked about walking in him? Put him on. It's not enough to walk and hold his hand. Let's put him on. So that where he goes, we have to go. Okay? That's why you put away all that junk. Because all that junk doesn't fit in him. <coughs> Walk in Him. Then you will know the knowledge of God. Then you will understand. Then you will know how to respond to those who are hurting. You'll know how to respond to those who attack and persecute you. Jesus gave us the example. We need to follow that. Verse 12. God has chosen you and made you His holy people. He loves you. So you should always clothe yourselves with mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. In the KJV... Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, vows of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. I found something neat studying this out. The one version says God has chosen you. The other version says you are the elect of God. So I went and looked up these words. I wanted to see, you know, are they the same? What do they mean? How does this work? And one of the first things that popped in my head was, many are called, but few are chosen. Have we heard that? Yeah. Well, let me give you a little explanation of that. That story, there's a king who is, uh, was, was holding a wedding, and all the fancy people couldn't show up. So he told the servants, go out, compel anybody that wants to to come to the wedding. Call them. He used the word, call them into the wedding. That word call, when you break it back down into the Greek, simply means invite. Give them an open invitation. Rich, poor, it doesn't matter. Give them the invitation to come to the wedding. So they do. And people of all shapes, sizes, uh, financial levels, well, they all show up. But there was one that the king came up to. He wasn't wearing his wedding clothes. He had been invited to the wedding. He was actually attending the wedding, but he wasn't dressed properly. So the king told the servants, go take him, throw him out, cast him out. Now Jesus was telling this parable. What was he trying to say? They invited him. Maybe he didn't, maybe he couldn't, uh, he just showed up. Well, who knows? But why would he throw him out when he was called and invited? Because that word chosen, that word elect, they're the same word. It's ekletos. Eclectus. My Greek is a little rusty, just so you know. That word means you are dressed for the wedding. Chosen and elect means you are dressed for the wedding. Look it up. Don't take my word for it. Go to the Strong's Concordance, break it down, look it up. That word chosen and elect means you are dressed for the wedding. <coughs> Matthew 22, 14 says, many are called, many are invited. The invitation, Jesus' parable meant this. The invitation is to everybody. The entire world is invited to come to the wedding. But few are chosen. Few are actually dressed for the wedding. So let me explain this to you. You can be invited. You can actually show up and attend. You can be at church every Sunday. You can tell people I'm a Christian. I'm part of the wedding. Without being dressed for the wedding. You can live the life and not have the garments of the wedding on. And when that day comes and God says, now it's time, 
and he starts walking around and he sees that you're not wearing the garments you're supposed to be wearing, he's going to say, get out. I invited you. You had every opportunity, but you didn't dress right. Get out. Read it for yourself. Don't just take my words for it. This is what the Bible says. That's why he says in Colossians 3, verse 12, put on, therefore, get dressed, y'all. Put the clothes on. The other version says, put the clothes on. Clothe yourself. It's not enough to say I'm a Christian. It's not enough to show up in church. You have to wear the clothes. You have to be that. You have to live that. Okay? Your actions need to look like what you're saying. If you tell everybody around you I'm a Christian, but you get drunk every Friday night, I'm sorry. You're not living like a Christian. If you tell everybody that you work with you're a Christian, but a bad, a bad customer comes in and you cuss them out when they walk out the door, I'm sorry. You're not living like a Christian. Yes, we make mistakes. Maybe a word slips out. But you know, I'm going to tell you something I learned when I was a little kid. Garbage in, garbage out. Don't put that crap in there. That crap ain't going to come out. I hope I didn't offend you. But it's true. We, we want to be Christians. We want to act like we've got it all together. But we rarely want to live the way we need to live in order to be a good Christian. Let me tell you why you should. It ain't about I'm trying to perform for God, so I'm going to act this way and live this way so that he'll like me. No. The Bible says that if we will walk in his will, if we will follow these things, that his favor is on us, his blessings are on us, that we will get long life. Proverbs said just when we started, he will give you long life for these things. You need to live and act and look like what Jesus lives and act and look like. Look like. Do you understand? I know this is hard. But the fact is, we've gotten too soft. And because we've gotten soft, we get pushed around all the time by the winds of this world. And we're not the strong place we ought to be. People come to church and they leave the same way they came. They come in with needs, they're hurting, they're in pain. And they don't get anything because there's no power here. Because we haven't lived in such a way that the power of God can show up. It's time we get back to being godly men and women. Looking like Him. Living like Him. Amen? So what should your garment look like? What do you put on? Bowels of mercy. Kindness. Humbleness of mind. Meekness. Long-suffering. Or bearing one another. If somebody were to sit down and describe you, your character, your personality, would those be the words they use? Ask yourself these questions. <coughs> or bearing one another, forgiving one another. If anyone has a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. <clears throat> if somebody hurts you, forgive. Let it go. I found that holding on to things causes me anguish and just anxiousness. And uh, I don't like feeling that way. I don't want to hold on to it. No, I don't like it when people hurt me or say mean things. Or, but you know what? I, I'm not going to hold on to that. Because to hold on to that is to plant a seed. And that seed of, of hurt turns into bitterness. And then it turns into anger. And then it turns into hate. And I don't want to plant those kind of seeds. I'd rather plant the seed of forgiveness. Because that grows into love and trust and hope. Verse 14. Even more than all this, clothe yourself in love. Love is what holds you all together in perfect unity. In the KJV, and above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. So when you love, it makes you complete. It makes you mature. When you love more than anything else, you'll find that it's easy to be kind. When you love more than anything else, you find that it's easy to forgive. 
When you love more than anything else, you find that it's easy to be long-suffering and forbearing with other people who are just not getting it. But it all comes from love. If you don't have a heart of love, you're going to struggle to look like Jesus. Verse 15. Let the peace that Christ gives control your thinking. Because you are all called together in one body to have peace. Always be thankful. In the KJV, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. That word rule means to control, to govern. The peace of God. If it doesn't feel peaceful, you need to check where you're at. If your thoughts or whatever actions you're getting ready to take, if it doesn't feel peaceful, you need to stop and think and say, God, Am I stepping out of line here? Because to walk with God means you can walk with peace. And if your life is chaotic and it's up one day and down the next and you feel like you're spinning and spinning and spinning, maybe you need to ask God, how do I get back into your will and out of my own? Because his peace ought to govern our lives. Every decision we make ought to be in his peace. Verse 16. Let the teaching of Christ live in you richly. Use all wisdom to teach and instruct each other by singing songs, hymns, spiritual songs, with thankfulness in your hearts to God. In the KJV, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with the grace in your hearts to the Lord. This is a good part I found. To let the word of Christ dwell in us richly simply means that his philosophy, his way of doing things, his thoughts are what should dwell in us. That word richly means in abundance. And if his thoughts and his ways are in us, doesn't the Bible say let the mind of Christ be in you? Or let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus? If his way of doing things is in us abundantly, that doesn't leave much room for my flesh and my ways. And when I live that way, I want to run around singing all day long. Because it ain't up to me to make decisions anymore. I'm just following his lead. It's easy to follow somebody who's got it all together. That's why it's so hard for you guys follow me. But good news, Jesus has it all together. And here's some more good news about this verse specifically. When it says teaching and admonishing one another, it doesn't say pastor teach and admonish all of these people. They're speaking to you. It doesn't mean only one man can teach and admonish you. Every single one of you sitting under the sound of my voice, God has gifted you to teach and admonish. And if you are living in God's will, if you have the mind of Christ and your thoughts are his thoughts, or his thoughts are your thoughts, then you can help, you can teach, you can admonish all those around you. That's what you're called to do. Now, no, not everybody's called to stand behind the pulpit. But we are all called to take the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are all called to teach and admonish every minute of every day. But understand, there's great responsibility with that. If you're teaching and admonishing gets tainted, or flavored by your flesh, you're going to lead people astray. And people are going to get hurt. And while you're standing back saying, I'm a Christian, you can follow me, and everything you're telling them is leading them straight to hell, then you know what they're going to do? They're going to say, that Christian told me this, so Jesus must not really be what they say he is. They're going to run from God again. You can't let, allow the good thing of God, the mind of Christ, to be tainted with your flesh. That's why it's so important that we put away all the junk and pick up the good. Do we understand? That's right. Amen. When I was young, we had an evangelist, or I don't remember, an evangelist maybe coming to a church we had in a revival. And during a prayer time, uh, they, you know, he was walking by praying for different people, and he laid hands on me and walked away. And when he did, I, I don't see visions. But I saw something that night, and it sounds silly. 
But you know what's cool about God is He will show you things in ways you can understand. He will speak your language. Now sometimes people say, God showed me this and they speak with all these big words. Maybe that's the way they see it. But here's how I see it. God showed me a line of people as far as I could see. It almost looked like the, the Great Wall in China. It was up and over hills and, like, and I was like blown away. And then I saw this big, you remember Mr. Kool-Aid? Yeah. Yeah. A big red picture and he bust through the walls and that kind of stuff. Well, I saw this big Kool-Aid picture. It had my face on it instead of Mr. Kool-Aid. <laughs> so God will speak to you the way you can understand. I love me some Kool-Aid. I take cherry flavor all day long. But I saw the hand of God holding that picture, pouring himself through my mouth. And instantly I felt in my heart God saying, don't taint what I'm trying to pour through you to them. And I've carried that for a long time. That fear, God, I don't want to taint what you're pouring through. Because if I taint what God's trying to pour through, it will not have the same effectiveness that God wanted it to have. It will destroy instead of bring life. That is why we must put away these other things and be what God's called us to be so that we don't taint the good news of Jesus. Yes, we are jars of clay. We are imperfect. But what flows through us is perfect. Because he is perfect. He is holy. He is righteous. And if we'll allow him to clean out our picture, then what flows through us will be clean and perfect. And it will do what it's intended to do, church. So my word to you today is this. Put away all the stuff that will taint your Kool-Aid. Let God clean up your picture so that everywhere you go, you are refreshing to those that he pours himself through you onto. Amen? Stand with me. And bow your heads.